Look at this. Well, wherever you are watching us in the world, hello and welcome to the Royal Television Society's programme on how to survive in streaming. I'm Nadine DeRaza. Now, whether you're a big streamer, a startup streamer or a consumer, today's session examines how to survive and more importantly, stand out in streaming. Now, before I introduce you to our international panel to talk about some of the best in class OTT or over the top offerings from the worlds of ad supported streaming, niche content, and multi service aggregation. We're going to set the scene with a run through of some of the key streaming terminology so we're all in the picture. But before that, let's start the program with a review of the latest OTT streaming service news this week. And our top story is the demise of Cubi, the mobile focus streaming service. Offering quick bites of video, QB has announced it will close just after six months of being operational, admitting it failed to attract enough subscribers. Set up by Jeffrey Katzenberg, the former Disney executive, it raised 1.8 billion US dollars from investors hoping to rival YouTube and Netflix. Talking of which, results for Netflix recent third quarter are in, and they show that it added 2.2 million subscribers, a little short of the 2.5 million forecast it had predicted. But they did exceed expectations in revenue. In trading, shares fell over 5% on the news. Now, following Disney's reorganization last week to focus on creating content for its streaming services, there's a slew of other companies thinking the same way. The UK's largest commercial public service broadcaster, ITV, will restructure its business and launch a streaming unit. It says that on demand will be its main area of growth, despite linear programme being its main source of revenue. HBO Max is to get higher priority within Warner Media, says its CEO, following a reorganisation that saw two top executives leave the company. And Viacom CBS announced it wants a more unified organization that will put extra emphasis on developing content for its streaming services. Discovery UK will rebrand its streaming player as Discovery Plus and add a subscription tier that will offer 13 channels and catch up for £4.99 per month in Great British Pounds or 6 50 if you like your money in US dollars. And finally, in this news review this week, DAZN, the international sports streamer, wants to distribute DAZN 1 and DAZN 2 as linear channels in Germany, one of its key markets. Well, that concludes the roundup of this week's streaming news. There's never a dull moment, is there? Now, unless you're living and breathing the lingo of streaming day in, day out, some of the terminology can get a bit confusing. So we're going to run through some of the key streaming terms and definitions that you need to know to hopefully get you through this broadcast in one piece. And first up, we have a VOD or video on demand. Or how about TVOD, transactional video on demand? 
If you add an S to SVOD, you get subscription video on demand. And how about AVOD? Well, that's advertising video on demand. And just to mix things up, FAST, which stands for Free Ad Supported Streaming TV. And OTT, which I've already mentioned, is over the top. Well, I hope you found that brief terminology run through useful to set the scene on how to survive in streaming. Now, from Disney Plus to HBO Max, Peacock to Apple TV Plus, the list goes on. Everyone is trying to get in on the streaming act. Yet with so many major subscription video on demand services on the market in 2020 alone, it's becoming harder to find unique ways to really stand out and drive subscriptions against the established players like Netflix and Amazon. And over the next 55 minutes or so, we've lined up three international speakers to talk through their business and distribution models and ambitions, and also to discuss the opportunities and challenges within the streaming sector to find out what kind of services are likely to thrive in such a crowded landscape and where the growth will come from over the coming years. Now, I'd like to encourage all of you to send in questions, comments and thoughts throughout the live broadcast. And then towards the end of the programme, I'll be putting some of your questions to the speakers. And I'm delighted to tell you that joining us in How to Survive in Streaming is Oliver Jolet, who's a senior, senior vice president of emerging business for Viacom CBS in pretty much everywhere in the world outside the Americas. He's a, a Frenchman in Berlin. Yes, he's joining us from Germany. A warm welcome to you. Also joining us is Daniel Berg, who's co-founder and CEO of Next Up Comedy. He's just down the road from me in London. Great to have you on the programme. And Alan Woke, who's co-founder and lead analyst from TREV, who's in the US and more specifically in New Jersey. A little secret, he's got his dog in the room with him called Teddy, which I'm very worried about mentioning now because Teddy may suddenly make an appearance. <laughs> and we're going to start with uh, Oliver Jolet from Viacom CBS Networks. And before we hear from him, let's take a look at his Pluto TV sizzle reel. What is this with? Shall we take a look? Wow. It's about to get real interesting. I like that. I'm so excited! Welcome, Oliver. I, I love the fact Square Bob Sponge Pants, or whatever his name is, made an appearance in that show reel. And there's a favourite of people all around the world. So lovely to have you here. And you're going to give us an insight into Pluto TV. And I know it's something under your successful leadership you launched in the UK, Germany, Switzerland and Austria. And it's quickly become one of the major European advertising video on demand platforms. But I don't want to give too many secrets away. So welcome to the programme. Thank you, Nadine. It's uh, thanks for the the warm words, and it's great to be uh, attending the uh, this panel with a great panelists. So, really looking forward to uh, this discussion with you. All right. So, first of all, welcome to the audience. Uh, I think, as a lot of you, I would have loved to be uh, in person in uh, in uh, beautiful London, uh, but I think uh, I want to thank the uh, thank the organization for. Uh, organizing such an event online. I think it's uh, great to have the industry coming up together uh, in this uh, difficult time. So thanks, uh, first of all, to, uh, to, uh, to the organization. Um, today, I really want to uh, give you a little bit of uh, insight uh, about Pluto TV, um, about our history, about our success story, and also try to explain why uh, AVOD and maybe fast, we just saw a beautiful animation on uh, the terminology is, uh, is actually those new models are booming in the, uh, in the streaming world. 
Um, so we can go to the next slide, please. And I, before starting, I, I as mentioned, I want to go back over six years, uh, 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 six years in the past, uh, on April Fool's Day, 2014. It is the day where we launched for the first time our beta from Twitter TV. And many thought uh, at the time that we were fools, um, launching a linear uh, product in the edge of on demand and a free product at supported in the edge of, uh, of, uh, of at supported uh, models was disruptive. Um, and I think I have to admit as well that when uh, when the uh, the first uh, funding uh, rounds were were in front of Pluto, it was tough to convince investors that uh, linear TV in the digital world had a potential. Um, back then, the conventional wisdom was that the whole TV business was moving towards a next VOD future only. Um, a lot of the industry experts uh, believed that viewers would only watch content on demand and would no longer tolerate advertising and therefore probably paying subscription to remove the ad. And of course, I think SVOD has become incredibly successful um, producing amazing content, but it's not the only game in town. At Pluto, we took a different approach, um, believing from day one that well-curated linear channel will be appealing as TV moves to the internet. Um, and I think the other phenomenon which is important is that a lot of people started to cut the cord, started to create their own bundle through a net full of apps and uh, where they stream their, uh, their, their, their content and their favorite content. Um, they have a lot of different paid service, but what we think is a huge value proposition is that anyone can expand the bundle for free with Pluto and get hundreds of channels and thousands of TV shows and movies for free. The vision that we have and the goal was really with our channels concept was to eliminate the paradox of choice for viewers, just dropping and watch well-curated channels. And why did we do that? I think that's, uh, that's something which is based on a lot of, 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 of insight, a lot of, of, of uh, behaviors that we saw on, on, on the market. The first one is that people are creature of habits and they don't want to spend 20 minutes working to find a piece of on-demand content every time they want to be entertained. The second thing I want to, to mention is that advertising has funding so much of the best TV content of the decades. And why should this model completely disappear? And the first part is obviously that's free is a tremendously attractive price for viewers. Uh, attractive and, and obviously they need to watch a bit of ads uh, in addition of free content. So moving to the next slide, please. Fast forward to today, Pluto TV is the leading free streaming television service in the world. We live in 23 countries beside the US, uh, uh, the, the US where we launched in 2014, as mentioned, we live in the UK, Germany, Switzerland and Austria in Latin America, and more recently since Monday in Spain. Um, we are entertaining on a monthly basis more than 33 million monthly active viewer, viewers growing at an exponential pace. As you know, uh, Pluto TV has been acquired by uh, Viacom CBS back in 2019. And when Viacom CBS acquired Pluto TV, uh, Pluto TV had only 12 million monthly active users, showing the exponential growth of such a model. Moving to next slide, please. So what is Pluto TV um, and why Pluto TV is successful? I'm gonna try in, a, in two slides to summarize that, even if it's not always easy. So the first thing is obviously being an, uh, an international player, which was part of the vision from day one is very important. So we have this planetary scale. Um, we have uh, working with over 200 partners uh, uh, worldwide, worldwide. And what we are doing is creating linear channels, creating linear channels which are very thematic. So going also against in a certain way to what TV is doing, and I will talk about that in the next slide, where TV tends to become more mainstream, we tend to go in a very, uh, in very niche and thematic approach, offering a chance for all kind of audience and whatever the test is. 
But beside that, the users will also find on Pluto a part of the uh, a section dedicated to on demand to also match in one product all the ca all different watching behaviors. The lean back approach, which is the core DNA of Pluto TV in the live channels uh, section, and uh, the lean forward uh, approach with the VOD section. The product is available everywhere on all kind of devices, big screen, uh, mobile, and web. But obviously, the, the ultimate experience is on big screen. We want to entertain the users on the in the living room. It's completely free, and it's something which is very important. It's it's uh, it's simple for the users to understand. It's simple as TV. You switch it on and watch. That's the TV uh, uh, the TV USP. In the case of Pluto TV, you download the app, the app, and you watch. Um, and I think when when we talk about the content, which is obviously content is king, the way Pluto TV is creating the channel is unique. We are offering a new way of watching content, a new way of watching linear content. Um, and all the channels that you that the users can enjoy on Pluto TV are, in a, to a certain extent, original channels. We are not willing to digitalize the, digital, the existing landscape by carrying some of the linear channels running on TV. There is some great application doing that across the world. We are creating the channels. We are creating something new for the users. You can go to the next slide, please. And then I want to talk about um, one um, topic. Why Avod and Fast, the uh, free ad supporting, uh, ad supported TV services are booming. I think what is very important as and we are a very user centric company and uh, whatever, um, when we launch a product, we always think user first, but it's not sufficient to create the market fit. It's not sufficient to make a product successful. You can be disruptive, but you may not have the market fit at the right time. So what we, what we notice is that the reason why Avod is successful is because some other industries massively change. And the combination of the user needs and the industry needs create the market fit. And there is mainly four topics I want to talk about. The TV industry, the streaming industry, but mainly the SVOD industry, the content industry, and the advertising industry. The TV industry created the lean back. And the lean back is amazing. The users don't have to think about what they want to watch. They just switch on and watch. The problem of the TV, I mentioned that, is that a lot of the channels, because of the business model, because of the way you sell advertising, are becoming mainstream and mainstream. It's a trend that you, see that you can see across the world. On the advertising side, the ability to target a single user is not feasible on TV. And obviously, it's linear. So this creates, in a certain way, the, 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 the needs of having a more on-demand uh, approach. And by the way, the biggest disruptor for me in this industry was the video recorder. It was the first time that users back in the 80s or 70s were able to catch up something they, they, which was running on linear TV. So this, the SV and the industry arrived a few years ago, um, Netflix being one of the pioneers in the service, and they started as an aggregator working with a lot of studios. They were not producing content. This happened just like with the first series being produced, I think is hours of cards. And this is that changed massively the, the business. From a sudden, a lot of those SVOD partners went to original content, went to produce content, creating a new window uh, for over players. Some content which were not available for Avod or over kind of businesses became available. I remember uh, uh, a few years ago trying to acquire Avod rights. It was very difficult. The industry was not ready to grant Avod rights. And I think that is the reason why it became uh, uh, feasible because the SVOD industry evolved. So new buying uh, strategy from the SVOD helped also the SVOD industry to create the market fit. Last but not least, the advertising industry. They're actually, in a certain way, the biggest loser of the success of the FCBOD services. Why? Because they're obviously ad-free services. And a product such as Pluto TV, and 
extending to all the other Evo products, but also the uh, the fast uh, uh, products, such as the Roku channels or what Samsung TV Plus is doing, is that Pluto TV and those services are creating an inventory, which is the perfect combination of TV in, and digital. It has the digit. It is a digital inventory, but with the power of TV ads, because those content and most of the consumption of those products is in the big, is in big screen. When you have a look at Pluto TV, ads is non-skippable, non-blockable. It is a hundred percent. Uh, a brand safe environment, 100% premium content. And that's what the advertisers are looking for. But they are the users, we can reach them in the living room exactly as TV is doing, but we can address every single user. And I think the combination of all those trends creates the market. And um, I think Pluto TV has been one of the leader and uh, we are the beginning of the story and we will expand uh, obviously in more territories. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oliver. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, that point you mentioned about launching at the right time. So not to be bleeding edge, but leading edge. So thank you very much for that presentation. Just want to ask you about Pluto TV and where it fits in generally with the Viacom CBS Network's overall strategy. And in particular, my mind is around the idea of the relaunch of CBS All Access as Paramount Plus next year and then the growth of Viacom's CBS present in the general SVOD, so subscription video on demand space, if you were paying attention earlier, competing directly with the likes of Netflix, um, HBO Max, and so on and so on. So how does Pluto TV and the FAST, that free ad-supported TV sector in general, fit into the overall Viacom CBS network's overall strategy? Yeah. Th that's a great question, Nadine. Um, we believe at Viacom CBS that... Um, we want to build a streaming ecosystem and 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 and, and proceed with a multi a multi, uh, a multi uh, path strategy. Um, we are currently obviously very successful in the network world in the traditional TV business, both as a free network and pay network, and we want to be as successful as we are in the network world in the streaming world. With a play, we're in the free streaming world with Pluto TV, and a play in the paid streaming world with Paramount Plus, our new brand that we, uh, that we disclosed a few, uh, a few months ago, uh, which will be, uh, as you mentioned, we will rebrand CBS All Access in the US into Paramount Plus, but we will be also launching Paramount Plus as a super size uh, uh, service in the Nordics, in Latin America and in Australia. So it's really for us very key to, to, to ex the strategy to have on the one end, as mentioned, a free streaming strategy and a paid streaming strategy. And I would even add one topic. We even had a kid streaming strategy. We recently launched Noggin as a kid's preschool product uh, into uh, Amazon Prime Video, for example. So that's as a, as a child. So it is also part of our strategy not to focus only on paid streaming, but also uh, have like different uh, products to play uh, and answer more importantly the, the user behavior. Indeed, sounds like you've got fingers in many pies. So in terms of Pluto TV, what's next specifically for Europe? I know it's a global brand, but just be interested to find out just from the European point of view. I mean, first of all, I mentioned that in my presentation, I'm extremely proud uh, as we launch uh, on Monday in Spain. So that was, uh, it is uh, obviously a, a huge milestone for, uh, for us. Um, we, we, we always, uh, one of the, uh, the, the mission of the company is to entertain the planet. So the planet is big, so we have way more to discover, way more countries to discover. Uh, we will be launching in Brazil by the end of the year. Uh, and also next year, we already announced that we'll be uh, launching in France and Italy. Uh, but it's only the beginning. We believe that the proposition that Pluto TV is offering can work and will work everywhere in the world. Uh, we have amazing feedback from users wherever we go. We are uh, obviously very local and very global. Global because our product is, uh, is a global product. Uh, but local because the content offering is key and it's key to be to be very local. Uh, 
Uh, and then to speak also about the UK, for example, which is very important, we will keep increasing our lineup. Uh, we currently have 110 channels live in the on the platform. Uh, our goal is to offer more more premium content. Um, you saw in the trailer that we that we that we uh, disclosed it's a US trailer. You saw the kind of uh, uh, shows running on on Pluto US. We have the same ambition in Europe uh, to have the same uh, the same kind of shows. The US market is way more advanced in the Avod market is way more advanced than the European one. But the European one is uh, is 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 growing quicker than the US one right now. So. We hope to uh, bridge the gap as well between the US market and the European market. So I foresee a brilliant future for Pluto TV in Europe. Thank you very much, Oliver. And obviously send your questions in for Oliver and our other guests as well. Uh, it'll be interesting to, to find out how quickly the European market will catch up with the United States of America and sounding, listening to Oliver there, it won't be too far behind as well. Okay, well, moving on to our next guest, I'm delighted to say that we're joined by Daniel Berg, who's the co-founder and CEO of Next Up Comedy. Um, and I, I know he's probably got loads of jokes for us as well, without putting him on, on the spot or, or putting him under too much pressure. But we're looking at the serious business of comedy as well, because actually it plays its part in a multi-billion pound market. So before we speak to Daniel, let's have a little sizzle and line up Next Up Comedy for you. And I'm gonna Why are you just looking at me? What are you just staring at me for? That is the stuff! Woo! Oh fuck off, I love it! Is this a humiliation stick? Wow. <laughs> I, I don't wee out of my bum. I never thought I'd repeat those words on, on a broadcast. So hopefully that hasn't offended anybody. Maybe we needed the bleeping machine as well. Daniel, welcome. I know you're the CEO and co-founder at Next Up, which is an online streaming brand that's basically propelling the live comedy world into a multi-billion subscription video market. As we saw in the video, while supporting comedians and also the wider community. So again, without sort of stealing your thunder, um, over to you. Welcome to the show. Great. Thanks so much, Nadine. Thank you to the RTS and everyone for having me along. I've even preempted your request for a gag by putting one in my presentation front sliders. People were often disappointed that uh, they weren't getting anything from a, a business pitch or a presentation on Next Up. Um, sadly, I'm not a comedian. Um, I'll let you read out that one uh, in your own time. Um, next slide, please, Phil. Thank you. Um, so before I get started too much on Next Up, a very quick bit of market insight. What's happening now in the subscription video on demand market is the exact same thing that happened in the linear broadcast market back in the 80s, where big mainstream platforms like BBC and CBS were flanked by specialist channels, which gave fans of those genres the breadth of content that they wanted and were, in, were able to serve them better than any other mainstream service. Um, whether you're a comedy fan, a music fan, history fan, there was a channel for you. Um, and as a result, those specialist services had great success. Um, next part of the slide, please, Phil. Thank you. And as you can see here in the subscription video on demand market, the same thing is happening again. So whether you're a fan of reality TV, British drama, even royal families, horror, there's a specialist service for you. And at Next Up, we are currently doing just that for the genre of live comedy. Next slide, please. And again. 
Thank you very much. So as you saw from our sizzle reel, we are a subscription video on demand platform specializing in live comedy. We have hundreds of shows across all the different apps. We launch on LG and Samsung next year. And we also have shareholders in the form of the former head of comedy at BBC Worldwide and the former president of MGM. So the founding team really know the stand up space and we've got a wealth of experience guiding us in the broadcast space as well. Next slide, please. Here are two things I thought was worth highlighting. As a specialist service, we know just what our comedy fan audience love, and that is discovering new comedy and supporting comedians. Next slide, please. Our content catalog has hundreds of comedy specials. Um, if you don't know the term comedy special, that's essentially a comedian performing for around 60 to 90 minutes on stage in front of a live audience. And I think the key bullet point here I'd like to highlight is that stand-up comedy costs an absolute fraction of uh, traditional genres, um, around 3%, we estimate. So it's an incredibly cost-effective genre for us to film. Next slide, please. Mm, there we go. Thank you. Um, and in terms of where we get our content from, this is an actual bit of research we did into the Edinburgh Fringe nominees um, for best comedy show and best newcomer over the last 20 years. So arguably the best metric for stand-up comedy in the world. And we discovered that 91% of these incredible critically acclaimed shows simply not filmed. So that's exactly the type of content which Next Up looks to film and acquire and bring to comedy fans wherever they are. Next slide, please. Essentially, whilst we're preserving shows for comedians and monetizing them and bring them to fans, we're delivering value on both sides for four different cohorts. Um, this is our little value system. And I think by sitting in the middle of that and connecting these four previously slightly disparate or not as well connected audiences, it's a hugely powerful and exciting position to be in. And that's why we have um, outreach from distributors, venues, comedians, and fans on all sides trying to go through us to try and get something from the other cohort of people. Next slide, please. And next slide, let's not see the word COVID for too long. There we go, thank you. So um, I think it's worth noting that when um, COVID struck, it had huge potential to be quite damaging to Next Up because we film live comedy and the whole of the live comedy world essentially shut down. However, we're a startup, we were able to move incredibly quickly. And one of the initiatives we launched straight off the bat was essentially bringing comedians to comedy fans through the power of live streaming via Zoom, Twitch, social media, and pumping out an incredible amount of streamed content. Um, it was an incredible time for us in the comics because there was a real dearth of comedy, I think, in just people's lives. And so still being able to bring that to people is a really, really great thing for us to do. Next slide, please. Ah, oh, yes. So we this all of our live streaming went so well, we basically put on a, a live streaming comedy festival where there was 31 acts which performed for 31 days. Um, and it went so well that we actually got some government funding to help put it on. We got a beer sponsor. And next slide, please. As a bit of a surprise, I, this is a bit of a tangent, but I'm really proud of this slide. A lot of the people who attended a couple of the shows without telling us all managed to make some thank you signs for us um, on the very last show of the festival, which was a really lovely touch. Next slide, please. Our comedy festival um, was really great, not only in terms of brand awareness and acquisition, um, but also us being able to work with a multitude of comedians who we previously didn't. And as such, we've repeated it twice already with two of the biggest comedy, fest um, comedy websites in the UK. The first being the British Comedy Guide um, and their Laughter Lounge, Lounge Festival, which was last month, and Chortle for their Comedy Book Festival, which actually launched yesterday, do check it out, nextupcomedy.com forward slash book festival. Um, and so these are just two further initiatives which basically play to our strengths of being a specialist stand-up service, allowing, allowing fans to not only discover new comedians, but to also support them by watching shows um, on our platform. Next slide, please. 
Um, so in addition to opening up the revenue streams in terms of ticketing and bringing on new users, we started to be seen as the go-to people for live comedy streaming, not only by fans, but by also by corporates. And an additional revenue stream opened up by putting on virtual comedy gigs for brands such as Innocent, um, we were an O2 priority moment, and we've got a cancer research gig coming up as well. And we're also looking to take on, or at least replace, the Christmas office party, which sadly probably won't be happening in its normal form this year, but given that we've been able to bring comedians into offices before with great success, we've launched StaffLast.com, which allows us to put on corporate gigs for um, corporations bringing comedy into their workplaces. Next slide, please. And, oh yes, yeah, so finally on our COVID response, as well as being able to still bring comedy to people, obviously a lot of comedians sadly were unable to work and as the go-to home for live comedy in the UK, one of the things we did was set up a Just Giving account, which some of the biggest names in comedy and lots and lots of support from the public donated into, which we divvied out on a weekly basis to comedians who needed it the most. This was not only, I think, a really valuable thing for us to do just as a company, um, but also helped demonstrate that we're not only in it for transactional purposes, we're here to support the genre we really love. Next slide, please. And again, thank you. So all of our hard work during COVID, I think, as you can see, we we're already on an upwards trend has only been amplified. The subscriber revenue increased, um, content distributors got in touch because they spotted what we were doing through all of our brand awareness pieces. And we also really cemented ourselves in the stand-up comedy landscape. And I think most crucially going forward, we really started to pioneer live streaming of comedy online. So not only putting out library pre-recorded content, and that is gonna play an integral part in our platform going forward. Next slide, please. Oh yes, this is a thank you slide and also an absolutely shameless opportunity um, for me to be a, a CEO of a startup and to thank you all for listening and to also mention that we do have an investment round which is only 70% full. So if you're interested in being part of our journey, I would love to hear from you. Thank you. Oh, well done, Daniel. Good plugs throughout, actually. And mm. uh, something about the pandemic where, you know, people really do appreciate the arts when it's not in their lives anymore. And comedians obviously play a huge part in that. And the fact there's a business that's supporting them because not only in the UK, but around the world, there's a, a sector of people in arts that have found it very hard, obviously want to find work because things are shut, but secondly, to get support when they need it as well. So um, it's encouraging news to hear what you've been doing. Just picking you up, obviously, on the COVID um, pandemic and the way it's impacted you, I appreciate that you're a startup. So obviously, you know, the figures that you're talking about, you may not have been as so severely impacted if you'd been around for quite a few years. But um, can you sort of drill down a few more figures for us in terms of, I'm a business journalist, I've got to ask these questions, but how has the pandemic impacted subscriptions, content pipeline and distribution? I know you mentioned those briefly, but let's look at subscriptions. I could see the graph going upwards. I mean, what, what are we talking about in terms of figures? Um, we, saw, we saw two bumps this year, essentially. One was in January, pre-COVID, when we prioritized annual memberships over monthly memberships. Um, that saw an increase of around, well, our, our annual members are now at 60% compared to our monthly members, which were 40. And before that, reprioritization it was only at about five percent so there's been a huge shift for us regardless of covid to prioritize people who pay us annually over monthly um, in terms of membership the second bump which was around may we saw roughly a 20 to 30 percent increase in our subs month on month um, and so it's been i think i mean essentially as you said there was a, a bit of a dearth of culture in the world and people's longing for it probably only increased so if there was ever a time i think to gain subscribers um it was back then i think and i think we took real full advantage of it 
you did. And then the content pipeline, we've just seen that pie chart, you know, that there's a huge amount of potential in the market if only 9% has been tapped in into, you know, live shows. So that obviously has got to be great news to you that the, the market is huge. Yes, it is huge. I think there's an incredible amount of good quality comedy content out there. Um, even sp stepping back from the sort of COVID scenario, um, the whole reason why we started Next Up Comedy is because we were comedy fans and we weren't getting served on demand the comedy which we saw winning awards at the Edinburgh Fringe and selling out and gaining crit critical acclaim. So being able to bring that type of quality content to comedy fans like us around the world um, is exactly why Next Up exists. Indeed. And in terms of Netflix, yeah, I've had to mention sort of the, the big N word. Um, what's to stop Netflix coming along, I don't know, and blowing you out of the water? And the same for any genre focused streamer. How do you approach keeping that competitive advantage, particularly when you know, you're competing with huge astronomical budgets that Netflix and others have? That's a good question. Um, so I guess on paper, there is nothing really stopping a Goliath suddenly deciding to specialize in a genre, whether it's in video on demand or homewares or the supermarkets. Um, luckily though, I don't think there's much of a track record of that really happening because I believe that most of the time the mainstream platforms are gonna want to create content which appeals to as many people as possible, i.e. mainstream. And so I think the chances of those people being able to go to the same depths as us spending every day at the Edinburgh Fringe seeing five shows a day to bring the absolute gems of live comedy to people, um, I think would be quite thin. Um, best of luck to them though, if they do try it, it's a hell of a slog. Um, so <laughs> I'd, I'd happily, uh, happily join them at a few shows trying to find out the, who the next big thing is. Yes, yeah, don't write them off though completely. And uh, without <laughs> being rude, are you, are you profitable yet? Show us the money. We, <laughs> so we've always been scheduled to be profitable at for the end of next year and until then we've got a really good range of investors supporting us until break even um we've got as i mentioned the former president of mgm uh, called bruce tuckman we've got a london-based vc firm called velocity who are founded by red bull's head of marketing and a whole load of other investors so we are on track to be profitable um and I think the future is going to be looking pretty bright. So, yeah, hopefully, uh, fingers crossed, we can be up there and um, being described as the Goliaths, maybe at the next RCS panel. Daniel, um, I'd love to be able to describe you as that. I'm sure it'll become reality. <laughs> and also, you know, if you don't know Daniel's background, just looking at it here, you know, you, I know you've worked on so many comedy centric projects, producing music videos for Comedy Central, yes, to writing for Carton Networks, the amazing world of Gumball, for which you won a BAFTA. So, any questions for Daniel, then please do send them in. In the meantime, Daniel, thank you very much for your time. And we look forward to seeing you at the end of the programme with the rest of the panellists. OK, well, let's move on. Our third and final panellist who's been waiting very patiently is Alan Woke, who's the co-founder and lead analyst of TV Rev, as we mentioned earlier, has his dog Teddy with him as well, which again, hopefully Teddy is being very well behaved and very, very patient. And um, before I have a chat with Alan, let's have a look at TV Rev's showreel sizzle. TV Rev was created to help the media industry navigate tumultuous times of television. The more you can give it to them in plain English, the way that they can actually understand it, the better it is going to be, the easier it is going to be. We use data to tell stories and do deep dives on everything from specific TV shows and networks to general advertising and viewership trends. We have expertly curated newsletters that go to the top TV executives that matter. We create special video series so that industry leaders have a voice. Welcome to you, Alan. What a fantastic sizzle reel that's been put together for all our panellists, not least your own. And I know you're here to talk about aggregation and bundling of multiple streaming services. And look at the legacy of the cable industry and then maybe compare it with what we're going through at the moment, which I'm intrigued to find out more about. Alan, thank you so much for joining the programme. It's over to you. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, and thank all of you for being out in the audience to allow me to virtually travel to the UK. Anyway, so we're going to talk about this shift to OTT that's happening now and then look at some of the trends. Um, we'll do it from a US 
centric perspective, but everything that's happening here is happening internationally at the same time, which is one of the other trends actually about the shift to OTT. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. So the biggest thing that's happening is the thing we've been calling the flixcopolis, which is really tough to pronounce. I've finally gotten it down. But basically, it is the launch of all of these giant, we've been calling them flixes, these giant multi-billion dollar services that all have aims to go international. So if we can move to the next slide, we will see that there are soon, go, there are already seven of, we have seven of them now with two more slated next quarter. So you have Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, which is part of Disney, Disney Plus, Apple TV Plus, HBO Max and Peacock, which have all launched. And then as we've been talking, Paramount Plus and Discovery Plus are going to be launching in the next quarter. That's a huge amount of content. And it's also notable because these flixes all have the sort of programming that is getting the most buzz about it. They have big name stars, big name directors. This is what everybody's talking about. And it's really putting the shift on it. Now, what's the other thing to think about here is that if you look back even a year ago, it was really just Netflix, Amazon, and Hulu. And a lot of people had Netflix. People have Amazon because you get free two-day shipping. Some people had Hulu, some didn't. But suddenly, this whole piece of the market has expanded tremendously. Um, now, the other interesting thing, if we can move to the next slide is that five of these flixes will also have an ad-supported option. They won't be um, Discovery may be fully ad supported, probably not though, but you see that Hulu, HBO Max, Peacock, Paramount Plus, and Discovery Plus will also have an ad support. They'll have an ad supported version and a ad free version, which obviously will cost more money. And again, this is key because you have this $75 billion ad market in the US and the money has got to go someplace. So it also makes it, the other thing that it does, is it makes it more affordable because the ad supported versions are often well under $10 US and thus it allows people to have more of these services. Um, the other thing that's going on, um, if we can move on to the next slide, is something called the FAST. Now you heard Olivier was talking about Pluto TV. Um, that's one of the FAST. It's free ad supported streaming TV services. And these have you know, really taken off tremendously in the last year or two. And it's interesting because they're, they're not brand new. You've had a service, Sony Crackle, which is a fast, or the original fast, has existed probably for about six or seven years already, maybe even longer. Um, but for some reason, they were sort of, you know, right place, right time, which is everything in this industry. And you've kind of got three sets of fasts too. So you have, you know, the... Th a bunch of them that are now owned, they didn't, they were independent, but they're now owned by the big networks. Pluto is obviously owned by VCBS. Tubi is owned by Fox. Zumo is owned by NBC Universal and Crackle Plus by Sony. Then you got another level, which is owned, which are two of the fast that are owned by the big streaming device manufacturers. You have the Roku channel and IMDB TV, which just rolls off the tongue there. Um, Amazon never being really good at naming things, but that is their free, that is their fast. Roku, um, I know some of you may not, may be tangentially familiar with it. Roku is, is actually the leading streaming device in the US. They are starting to move into Europe and other parts of the world, but they don't have the same penetration as they do in the US. Um, the reason that they had gotten so popular in the US is there's twofold. One, they have a really simple interface. It looks like they basically ripped off the iPhone. So if you can imagine what an iPhone looks like with the little squares of apps, that's what the Roku interface looks like. Um, Amazon obviously has taken off because they have all the marketing power. They're both much cheaper. They've also beaten out Apple TV because Apple, for some puzzling reason, has not introduced anything other than a $180 device, whereas um, the lower end Roku and Amazon Fire TVs are $29. Now, what's interesting with both the Roku and the IMDb TV Fast is that they're using those, especially Roku channel, as a sort of an aggregator. So you can, you log into the Roku channel and you can subscribe to other services there. They're selling advertising off of it. Um, both Roku and Amazon have also started introducing their interfaces onto actual TV sets. You don't need to buy a separate device. 
Roku owns a little bit over 25% of the U.S. smart TV market now through deals with a lot of the low-end Chinese manufacturers. Then they'll speak, and speaking of manufacturers, the last group you have there is the smart TV OEMs. Um, Samsung, Vizio, and LG have also launched their own versions of the FAST. Um, they kind of looked at what Roku and Amazon were doing and said, hey, there's ad revenue here, and we want our users to be able to sort of turn on the TV and boom, they've got programming. Now, some of them say Vizio originally did a deal with Pluto, and that was powering it. But it's still, it's another way to get people used to this notion of, I don't need cable anymore. Look what, look what is on streaming and everything is happening there. So if we move on to the next slide, we can see that the biggest thing really is going on now, and this is what's going to change everything, is that people are waking up, and this really happened a lot during the pandemic, as people spent more time with streaming, to the fact that there is more and better programming on OTT for less money. Now, just to sort of frame it from you know, in the U.S., the average cable bill, if you have more than one TV, you're paying well over $100 a month for cable. Um, they charge you for set-top boxes. I know when I was shocked when we finally got rid of our cable that I was paying $12 a month each for three separate cable boxes. Um, and so people are realizing this, and this is really going to, you know, in the next, we're thinking, two to five years, is really going to shift the entire industry, not just in the U.S., but globally. So if we go on to the next slide, we can, we're going to start to see some of the trends so that just says trends. So let's move on from there. So one of the things that will be interesting with OTT, and it's something that funny enough came up with Olivier, is this three-tier platform that we're going to start to see from a lot of the services. So what, we're, what we've been hearing from people and what we're seeing is that there's going to be three tiers. So say we'll use Viacom CBS, it's easy. There's Pluto, which is their free ad supported service. Then they will have, you know, um, blanking on the name, not, I keep wanting to call it Platinum Plus, um, Paramount Plus, um, which is their, uh, which will have two versions of subscription ad supported and then a subscription ad free. Um, this will allow them to get viewers to Pluto, right? Because it's free, so everybody will be there. And then they can slowly upsell them into Paramount Plus by either showing previews of some of the series that are on Paramount Plus or just running promos for it there. And everybody's going to be doing the same thing. Um, NBC is going to be doing it. They have an ad free, they have a fast version of Peacock, which is their streaming service, and then two layers too. And that's really going to be what happens over the, you know, with a lot of these services, um, not so much Netflix or some of the internet ones, but all the ones that start off in TV. And they're going to take this model internationally as well, which if we can move on is going to be the next trend is the international expansion. So Netflix is really the model here. Netflix has a presence in every country in the world, except for China, North Korea, and Syria. Um, They've been very generally been very smart about how they expanded internationally. They've been partnering with local programmers. They've been trying to get content that makes sense for that market rather than just sort of imposing American TV programming on them. They have had a couple of slip up slip ups, especially in developing countries, India being the prime example where Netflix had originally gone in and tried to charge the equivalent of ten dollars U.S., a little bit less than that, but in, in that range in India. And there's a local service, which is actually now owned by Disney. It had been owned by Fox called Hotstar, which is, a, which is under $2 a month for the ad-supported service. And Hotstar has just been kicking Netflix butt all over the place in India. Netflix tried something recently where they have introduced a mobile-only version of the app, which I think is about $5 a month. But they really haven't been able to figure out the right pricing option for a lot of the developing world. That said, they're doing you know gangbusters in Europe, in the more developed parts of Asia. They are just in the last quarter, they hit over 10% penetration in South Korea and Japan. So everybody else is looking at this and going, wow, how do we get in on this? And that's going to be the next big thing is you're going to see, you know, basically a, an invasion of all of these major US services internationally, especially in Europe, where it's a much more developed market and they know they can get in. And it's going to prove very disruptive to the entire television industry around the world. 
Now, the final trend that we're going to see, which was on the next, well, two more trends, actually. So the next slide is you know, this shift away from cable and over the air that we're going to start to see massive cord cutting um, in the U.S. And the U.S., remember, has much higher has much higher cable penetration than pretty much anywhere in the world. You know, we're a big country and over the air is pretty shoddy. Like, I, you know, I live maybe 15 miles from Manhattan and, you know, even with a really good antenna, we don't really get that many of this, you know, we, depending what room I'm in, I get diff different stations. So, but we're going to start seeing everybody shifting away from that over to streaming, just because as I had mentioned earlier, there's just so much there. It's better, it's going to be better programming and it'll be less money. The other thing that's really interesting we're going to start seeing is right now, all of these networks are making two sets of programming. They're making programming for their broadcast, right? For traditional cable and linear. And they're making another set of programming that goes on their streaming service. At some point, they're going to stop making enough money from cable to fund the, you know, sitcom, especially sitcoms and dramas, which are expensive. And we, we think they're going to start seeing one set of programming and that the linear channel is going to sort of be another version of the fast as it slowly sort of fades away. But that'll be sort of the free programming will be on there. They may do some game shows, reality shows. Those are low budget. Um, but everything is going to move to streaming and that's going to be huge. So the last trend, um, if we move on to the next slide, is something we've been calling the great rebundling, um, which is basically... All of these guys look out and say, what's our biggest problem now? It's churn. There's nine services. People are, you know, they're all on a month to month basis. And so people are just like, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? I'm going to watch this month. That's a big conversation piece. Which services are you subscribing to? What are you watching? Now, if you're an ad supported service, you want to lock people in for a year. So you can go to advertisers and say, you know, yeah, we have. 5 million subscribers now, and I promise you will have 5 million subscribers six months from now, which you can't do if you're on a month to month. And even if you're not ad supported, you have investors that are interested in how many subscribers you have. And then there's this battle for programming. So if you want to convince Quentin Tarantino that he should make his first TV series with you, you want to be able to say to him, yes, we guarantee you that 20 million people will see this when it's when it's you know when it's finally out there. So everybody's going to be looking to put bundles together. So there's quickly there's sort of three ways that's going to happen. One is that the individual services themselves will start offering one year or two year subscriptions at a discount. That's already happening. Hulu does it. Disney has a package where you can get Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN Plus, their sports network as a bundle. CBS All Access has started giving a one-year subscription. I think they all take 15% off. The other people who are going to start doing the bundling are the MVPDs, the, you know, the, the broadband providers, because they're going to say, we'll give you broadband and, uh, you know, for the flexes for X number of dollars a month, you pick it. But it, they don't really care about pay TV. It's just a way they make most of their money at this point from selling broadband subscriptions. So they just want to create stickiness. So if they can get you locked in, all you know, everybody wins. And then the third is, is the actual device manufacturers and even some of the, the TV OEMs are also going to start doing things like that. So Roku or Amazon will, are, you know, they've already done this with their channel stores, start creating bundles off of that where you're locked in. They, they may give you a free device. You may get the TV for free or almost free if you do it. But that's sort of how we see that all happening. It's really going to sort of come back together. The good news for consumers, though, is these new bundles will be bigger and better than what they had before. And then of course you have access to all the fast as well because they're free, so they're in every bundle. So that is sort of where we are now. Um, and I will turn it back to you, Nadine. Thank you very much, um, Alan. Yeah, it's interesting how you mentioned Roku. That was actually my first streaming device I bought um, many years ago, actually. But I must point out, being independent, there are other good, fast TV services on the market. I'm not favouring one over the other by mentioning that. But interesting how you said that, you know, that in America, they are the biggest, but haven't had the same penetration around the rest of the world. Um, just to pick up on um, the idea about cable TV and the synergies you know, we see that shift from general entertainment to fragmented, genre-focused niche services, the introduction of tiered 
differing tiers based on advertising and subscriptions and even one-off digital transactions. It does look like it's looking like cable TV all over again. Is that a fair assessment? Have I read that wrong? It's it's pretty fair. It won't be as awful as cable TV. I mean, <laughs> one of the really interesting things we've been seeing is that a lot of the smaller cable networks are, are already starting to shift over to the fast, right? So they sort of look down the road and they said, okay, as cord cutting picks up, the net, the, you know, the providers are going to try and offer smaller bundles and we're not going to be part of those bundles. So let's, you know, strike a deal with a Pluto, a Tubi, a Zumo, and bring our programming over there. And, you know, their basic model is, is the same. I mean, you know, in the U.S., you have as many as 500 of these cable channels. I know you guys get them through Sky and whatnot as well. And their model, right, is basically let's take a bunch of reruns, put them up, and run ads against them and collect the ad revenue. So they can do that just as easily on the fast. The fast have sort of, you know, as Olivia was saying, recreated this linear stream, the fact of like, you know, it's sort of that, lean back TV, I'm making dinner, I'm checking email, I'm doing something else, just put something, you know, something on. And they can monetize that. And they're realizing, you know, okay, at some point, we're just going to be bumped out of, you know, over the air and cable, let's let's set up shop here. And the fast are thrilled because it's like, oh, here's an identifiable brand name that's going to create stickiness. Alan, um, just had a question in, which has been sent to me. Do I hear okay. Alan is implying the death of linear free to air? If so, when will that happen? And we'll take that question, then I'll get the other panelists in after that. I think it will happen a lot sooner in the US than in Europe. I think that it will be a long time, though. I think it's going to be easily 10 years because there's a lot of legal reasons why free to air and broadcast TV has to stay on TV you know, all through the world. There's sort of regulations that were written 50, 60 years ago, and there's still going to be a market that doesn't have a broadband connection. I mean, the good news is that once you do have a broadband connection, it will, you know, these channels will still be free, but I think that a lot of them will continue to broadcast over the air. They will just have smaller and smaller audiences, and at some point it becomes, you know, it just does, doesn't become economically feasible to keep them going. Remember, too, in the U.S., um, we have a law that it's only 39 percent of the individual broadcast stations can be owned by any particular network. So most of the free to air stations in the U.S. are actually either owned by sm you know, smaller conglomerates or even independently owned. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stations that great grandpa started, you know, 90 years ago and are still still going. Yeah, indeed. OK, well, let's bring Oliver and uh, Daniel back in as well so we can see all of our panelists. There they are in all their former glory, back together, reunited. Um, just based on what uh, we've heard Alan say, um, Oliver, if I can get your answer to this question. You know, what kind of streaming services are likely to thrive in such a crowded landscape as the over the top industry? So what business and distribution models stand out? from the major subscription funded general entertainment services like Netflix, HBO Max, Amazon, Peacock, and so on. I know you've sort of alluded to some of that in your presentation and hearing the others, but just be interesting to hear your thoughts. I, I think what we are seeing is obviously that the access to content is key. Um, and I think what I see at our strategy at Viacom CBS, uh, especially since the, the merger between Viacom and CBS, we're one of the biggest production company in the world. Uh, and we've been also creating uh, content, creating brands for decades. Um, and I, I think it's a huge asset. Uh, the history of such, uh, that you have is, is a huge asset uh, to be successful in the streaming world. Whether we, you go on a on the free streaming service. Um, it's always good to have a deep library that you can monetize. And it's the case at Vacom CBS. Even on, on Pluto, we are working with a lot of uh, different partners. We are a free landscape in a way. Uh, and, and, and it's even more important when you're doing paid streaming where you have to have the capacity to produce at scale. Um, so I think that that's probably going to be a, one of the key topics. Uh, a couple of new players are new in the production world. Um, and, and, and it's uh, obviously something where, uh, I mean, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a new business and they will need to learn that as well. 
Indeed. And um, what does it actually take to win the streaming wars? Um, Alan, if I can bring you in. If it, I mean, I don't know if it's fair to call it a war with such a variety of services fitting into different categories. I mean, I know you mentioned about making there's going to be greater choice and that rebundling. But, you know, what will it take to actually win the streaming wars? Well, I don't know that there's you know, it's funny. A lot of times people sort of frame it as, you know, Netflix. I used to hear the term Netflix killer. And it's like no one's going to kill Netflix. There, you know, there's there's room for most of them to survive. And I think it'll be at least five years before anybody stumbles. I think, you know, to something you were saying earlier, it's going to be a lot like the old school TV where it really depends on who has the hit shows and different services will have different, you know, periods. Like, say, in the U.S. in the 90s, NBC had, you know, um, Seinfeld and Mad About You and Friends, and suddenly they were the hot service and everybody was watching NBC. And I think all of the flexes will go like that, too, where somebody will sort of hit on something. They'll have a couple of series everybody wants to watch. They'll be hot for two or three years and then somebody else. But I think they all basically really need to figure out what they're going to be when they grow up, right? What they're going to be about. They haven't really, right now, they're all trying to be all things to all people. But at some point, one's going to be the hip network. One's going to be more kids, more family. And I don't, th I don't see any of them really going out of business anytime soon. Maybe you and I should set up Platinum Plus, Alan. That was a good idea for a name. Yeah. I know you were, <laughs> I know you were thinking of Paramount Plus at the time, but yeah, yeah Platinum yeah. Plus. Someone is going to be setting up that business just now, aren't they? Um, I mean, Daniel, as a specialist service, is it a fear that a big player will start offering your content? Is that something that you worry about? Um, to a certain degree, yes. Um, I think there's always a chance when there's a a big player that they might start dabbling. Um, I don't think there's much chance that they'll go beyond that or start to match what we do. If anything, it could potentially be seen as a positive because those platforms have incredible reach. And if they introduce perhaps a comedian or um, someone up and coming that people aren't familiar with, it might effectively act as a bit of marketing for a platform like us and get more people into discovering new comedians. and. If that is something people start to like to do, there's probably a, um, a preference for them to go to our platform rather than just digesting the one or two shows that the bigger platform is supplying. Thank you for that answer. Now, we've only got a couple more minutes before we have to wrap up um, this session. So just very briefly to look outside your own areas. Um, and I know TV Rev obviously keep an eye on, on the market in general. But what services other than their own have caught their attention and what do they think stands out about them and why? So let's let's go Eurovision Song Contest to Berlin, to Oliver. Well, I think I would give 12 points to Disney+. Plus. Um, because, I mean, they've just did an outstanding job uh, in, I mean, launching with an, an amazing, powerful brand, um, a super strong content. But when uh, when we have a look at the uh, at the current figures, um, I think it's it's just uh, outstanding. So I would really give 12 pounds to, to Disney Plus. Uh, and, and, and especially in the, in the in the short time, I mean, we're talking about they, they've been live for a uh, six months um i think that's uh, that's uh, that's really a strong performance indeed and uh, the same question to you daniel your thoughts uh i think i'll give 12 points i think there's a specialist service called true royalty um which specializes in royal family programming and they've got incredible numbers and I think a lot of people could be a little bit snobby about such a specialist genre and the way in which they've demonstrated such incredible growth and proved potentially a few naysayers wrong by showing that there is a huge market for such a niche. Um, I think it's really inspirational for a company like Next Up who are perhaps a couple years behind them. And can you answer that question in a way, going to New Jersey? I know you're not usually part of the Eurovision Song Contest and probably thinking, what the hell are we <laughs> I, talking I, I about? Know what, I know what it is. I know what it is. Um, I will give 12 points to Peacock, NBCU service, because they, more than anyone, really adapted in a very smart way to the conditions of the pandemic. They were going to launch a, you know, a Flix, a paid service, um, this summer. And they kind of looked around and said, you know, we were going to launch it with the Olympics and that's not happening. We don't have any original program 
any original programming to launch it with, you know what, rather than try and charge people for it, we're going to give it, we're going to launch it for free. We're going to collect email addresses for people. And then, you know, when to sign up, you have to give them an email address. And then when we have something, we can upsell them. But in the interim, at least we'll get subscribers. So I, that, that was just a really smart way to handle, you know, the realities of what are going on now. Now, gentlemen, for succinctness, I'm just looking for one sentence. Where will the growth in the OTT industry come from over the next two to three years from? Apart from Next Up Comedy. Of course. <laughs> um, well, that's a tough one. Blimey. Um, I mean, I think it's ex specialist exclusive content. Is that fair? I think people who do things which is exclusive and brings quality content to fans which they wouldn't get elsewhere. I mean, that's not yeah. a revolutionary statement, but it's a statement nonetheless. We'll, we'll accept that answer. Alan, same to you. Um, I think it's going to come internationally. Um, I think it's going to be you know, everywhere from Europe to Asia to a lot of the developing world as all of these other flicks start you know, permeating those markets and growing, that there's going to be a much bigger shift there than there had been, and that's where they're all looking to get subscribers. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. We could carry on all day, but uh, sadly, time has got the best of us. Leave them wanting more, hopefully. So thank you so much to our panel, to Oliver. Thank you very much indeed. I think you've got some um, screaming children to attend to in the background. I, my children I'm have grown so up, so that's all right. I'm sorry no, about we the, love it. the noise in the back. <laughs> Yeah, they, I think they sound fine, actually. But uh, yeah, my, luckily, my children have grown up, so I don't have that to contend to. I, I feel for you as well. They very well behaved. It's nice to have them part of the programme. Also, thank you to Daniel as well, uh, co-founder and CEO of Next Up Comedy. Alan, and come on, let's get Teddy out again. Is, is okay. Teddy still there? Yeah. Was he? Teddy's, yeah. Teddy's asleep, so the old, I oh, will let sleep no, dogs leave. Love. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. No, thank you very much to our panellists indeed. It's been fantastic to have you all here today. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's session on how to survive and stand out in streaming. On behalf of the Royal Television Society in the UK, thank you very much for watching us. Just to let you know, in a couple of weeks' time, um, you can do it all again, not with me, but there'll be another host uh, two weeks' time on Wednesday at 4pm. It's another session from the Royal Television Society and it's called 2020 Visions Reviewing Digital Production Partnerships. So not to be missed, full details can be found on the site and how to join the registration for that as well. All the details will be on there. So thank you again uh, for watching and for joining in with the programme. Thank you to my producers, um, Phil and Damien, if I can say the word producers. Stay safe and well, everybody. And until next time, thank you for watching and goodbye.